All right. Well, I am going to uh, call the meeting to order. It is 6.31 p.m. Uh, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Uh, I think within seconds, every member of the council will be uh, will be logged in. And so we can get started. Um, <clears throat> a, a moment about uh, meeting logistics. Uh, anyone who's joining remotely, and we welcome remote participation, please change your name display to indicate your uh, first and last name so we have a record of who's participating. Anyone who is uh, speaking, we would ask you to start by stating your name and where you live. And if you're coming to speak about a particular agenda item, we ask that you address us during that agenda item and limit your uh, your comments to three minutes. Uh, Councillor Bate will assist us with uh, with the timekeeping. Um, anyone who wishes to speak must be called. Uh, and she's holding up the the yellow card, which is one minute left, and red card, out of time. Um, <clears throat> Anyone who speaks out of turn or on your main topics will uh, receive assistance to uh, bring come back into compliance with the rules. And the first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Um, is everybody happy with the agenda as proposed? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Okay. Okay. All those in favor? All right, the agenda is approved. Next item is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic which is not on tonight's agenda. And uh, we will take uh, people here in the room and also people on the uh, online. Uh, if you're participating remotely, we would ask that you use the uh, remote hand function on your computer because that's the easiest way for us to know that you're asking to be recognized. And I see online Ken Russell already has his hands up. So Ken, I'll call on you first and you'll have an opportunity to unmute yourself, which you may already be. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ken Russell. I live in East Montpelier. I work in Montpelier. Um, I'm coming tonight because um, tomorrow at 4.30 on the State House lawn, there will be a vigil for people who have died outdoors in the last year. It's an event being put together by our local, what used to be called a continuum of care, our local um, Washington County Homeless Housing Coalition. Um, so Kathy Partlow, Ramsey Papp, uh, and I and others, uh, Beth Ann Mayer, have all are all participating in putting this on. Um, we, those of us working in the, in these issues, uh, we experience a steady drumbeat of people dying, um, or being, you know, ground up by the conditions that they're in. Um, it's a very, uh, heart, heartfelt, heart moving event. Um, it's a, I think an appropriate thing to do on the longest night of the year and invite you all to come out. It's again at 430 on the state house lawn. If you uh, th there will be a circle there, and if you know anybody um, that has died in the last year, or you know even even within you f you feel like calling out beyond that, uh, feel free to do that. I I I will definitely have some people myself, and so thank you for all your good work. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> do I see any other hands online? Um, I'm not. I don't think so, but I'll pause and I, I have, there are also other scouts in the room who are looking for hands also. Okay, is there anyone in the room who would like to be uh, to be heard? Come on up. <laughs> I know. Hi. Uh, is this picking up okay? Yep. Uh, hi, I'm George Olson. I live on 25 uh, Hubbard Street. Um, and I want to speak about the Elks Club property. 
So uh, in light of the changes by FEMA recently, um, uh, this might be a good opportunity to review the city's plans for the Elks Club. Uh, if I recall correctly, the vote to fund the purchase was a close 50-50, 50 to 50 vote. Uh, we mostly agree that we need housing as soon as possible. Uh, I don't believe that the city is known for its ability to develop properties in a timely manner. Um, I don't think that the city should be involved in developing properties, as a matter of fact. Uh, so a question to consider is, is it time to sell the property to experienced qualified developers who can create the vision that we have in a timely and efficient way? If yes, perhaps we can use the revenue to support flood mitigation downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, come on up. Um, we've got several trip hazards, these cast iron sidewalk grates that get hit by a plow or cracked, even the brand new ones get cracked and left to trap, you know, and Public Works goes by it every day. They need to be removed and gravel put there to level it to make a simple, ha you know, hazard innocuous until we can afford new grates, which might be a while. Uh, been plowing onto the sidewalk on Court Street rather than plowing the snow off of the sidewalk. So I was traveling to the State House today and we got snow piled in the middle of the sidewalk, uh, apparently intended to stay that way. Uh, flood prep, we have LIDAR data for the whole state, very, very accurate three-dimensional topography. We could have not set everybody re-traumatized so many people by having completed flood maps in our GIS and shown, just notified the few parcels that were needed to take extra precautions. You know, we know who, who they were. They weren't all, the whole town didn't need to uh, react uh, this past week. Uh, we don't have any method to do that, to actually, we don't track. We just figure the water's coming and everybody should, you know, I heard from, of a tenant uh, on Elm Street, Down Street manages those properties. The city was heavily involved in the development of those properties back, I as I recall, in the 90s. Uh, rent jumping from 700 up to 1200 and being forced to move. You know, I, I think we need to keep stronger attached accountability to uh, who's managing assets that we help develop, uh, that's, that's an unconscionable uh, rent increase for subsidized housing, which we intended it to do. Transit center, the silt is still on the handicap ramps. Down Street's not doing their part in the maintenance, neither is Green Mountain Transit, and nobody's policing it or enforcing the lease, as I've said before. Now is an opportune time to address the walkway. Talk, let's talk about real world impacts on it, people every day. The access between and among the Haney lot up to the hotel lot or behind Christ Church and then up to the bike path. There, I FOIA'd the plans. I found there was at one point a walkway supposed to attach to that curved wall and it disappeared from the plans and there's no paper trail for who disappeared it or why. But now would be, with a new hotel owner, now would be an opportune time to renegotiate an expansion of that easement onto their lot to get a, a curved walkway hugging that round wall, accessing those three level lots. Because walkability of the downtown is one of our primary goals that you should be grounded in. Um, Elks Club, still no shower. Uh, COVID outbreak, uh, you were warned about Congregate shelters are not a smart thing in in the COVID in an ongoing pandemic, and here we did it, and we are suffering with it. Uh, that was addressed in the appropriations committee. They heard from folks about shelters. One of the con one of the folks there who has that section in her budget clearly says congregate shelters are not smart. 
Thank I you, heard Steve. You. Your time is up. Well, I've got a couple more items. Okay, your time is up. And well, I've asked for the expended. I asked at a prior meeting for how much have we expended so far on the Elks Club, and I got no answer. Okay, your your time is expired. So you just want to sweep all this under the rug? We'll get you that answer. Okay, is there anyone else in the room who would uh, like to be heard? Come on up. Hi, uh, I think, well, I know all of you here know me, but uh, I'm Dan Tola. I'm a resident of Montpelier and the head of uh, Parker Advisors. We're a process improvement consulting firm uh, focused on ending homelessness and improving dramatically the lives of people with mental health conditions and substance use disorder. I'm here to, tonight to discuss the unfolding situation relative to the permanent homeless shelter. Um, the, right now, there's a confluence of factors uh, that are offering us an opportunity if we act now. And most importantly, uh, there is available, there is funding available at the state and federal level which will either be allocated and or expire during the early part of 2024. In, it, in addition, the, in addition, another reason to act now is uh, some of these funding opportunities may require legislative action so the sooner we get in the queue and get organized for the legislative session the better um, just to give you an example uh, right now uh, this the governor has proposed uh, allocating funds to set up shelters uh, across the state and uh, Montpelier is one of the localities that's being considered um, but again the sooner we get organized the sooner we get our ducks in order the better um, Meanwhile, of course, you know, the primary candidate for this was the, the, uh, the rec center, which, uh, as you all know on the committee, my partner Paul and I, in our report to you in, in March, proposed uh, as being, at, at that time, the, the, the best option for the homeless shelter. Um, in addition, there are other, uh, other alternatives that, are, that have surfaced recently, uh, including uh, the Bethany Church is for sale. And of course, you, uh, many of you probably are aware that was used for a number of years as the winter overnight shelter. So there's some experience with that space. So what's the key issue? Money, funding. Um, now I'm aware, Bill, that, that your team uh, has raised or at least is close to raising, Bill, uh, 1.5 million, correct? Uh, From so Efficiency Vermont? Well, we, we have a grant application in for that amount. Okay. And of that, I understand uh, either of that or in addition to that, we have to come up with $300,000 of match funding? That's correct. Okay. And there's at least one other grant that your team is working on that I've heard of through the grapevine related to the shelter? Possibly, yeah. Possibly. I, I'm not aware of a specific grant. We've been, we've been talking to people who may want to all, all, I guess I wasn't prepared to be questioned during your comments, but um, let me get my... Uh, We've applied for a grant for uh, efficiency improvements that would deal with our systems, uh, electrical, heating, all that kind of modernize everything. That's the efficiency for Vermont. Uh, the council authorized or directed the staff to look at uh, the feasibility of, of this building being upgraded and used for a homeless shelter um, along with the potential other activities, possibly cohabitating with recreation, possibly in housing if Rick were to move. Uh, and so we have been talking with shelter providers and their funding sources as to whether they would be able to um, provide funding to bring it up to a state of art, including the front bathroom section being available to the public. Right. So that's where we're at. We have, yeah. that's Great. what we're thank, doing. Thank you. And that's all, we talked about that a couple of meetings ago. Yeah. Great. Super. So, um, and that 1.5 is for HVAC and electricity, correct? Yeah, all yeah. building systems. I don't have all the details. Excuse me? Yes, yes, all building systems. Yeah, sorry, I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in addition to that 1.5, if that comes through, um, obviously there'll be an initial, uh, there'll be additional funding needed. So, my proposal to you all is that my firm, uh, Paul Capcara, uh, myself, and we are now part of a consortium of consultants who have a set of expertise, in, including fundraising, grant writing 
both at the local, state, and federal level, that that you engage well, us. Your, your, your time is up. I suggest you uh, put this together. It, seems, it looks like we've already, already got it in writing. Please get it to us in writing so we can sit down and uh, talk about it. My proposal is that, that you hire, hire my firm on a okay, contingent your, fee. Your time. I, I Can I just in, finish my sentence? I enforced the time with the previous speaker, and I feel I need to, in fairness, enforce the time with you also. Okay. But but we I. The time to act is now, do. though, team. Got it. So just just so you're aware, there's a, there's a window of opportunity. We we need. You meant to say in unfairness. What? You meant to say in unfairness. <laughs> Okay, is there anyone else in the room or online who would like to, uh, to be heard? Okay. Next item on the agenda is the uh, consent agenda. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. I'll make a second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. You have approved the consent agenda. Next item, we have the uh, complete appointments to the Complete Streets Committee. And we have some clarification on this topic from, from the pre previous meeting. Um, do you want to? Uh, I think we sent it out okay. to the council. I, we had there had been an applicant who had withdrawn, so that's why some people had seen the application because that had been in fact happened. And um, but the final version that everybody had was correct. So, so it looks like we have three applicants: two seeking reappointment, one seeking initial appointment, and four vacancies. I make a motion that we accept the three applicants. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so thank you to Matthew Thayer, John Kim, and Nancy Schultz for continuing to be willing to serve. Uh, Jack? Yes. Can I do a little housekeeping. Can we push this back so I can see you? I had the same problem last week. Uh, that would be really great. Everybody's love to make it. Thank you. That's enough. That's enough. Great. Thanks. Thank All right. Next up, um, Evelyn, are you up for the budget priority survey? Log back in. All right. <coughs> Come on. All right, I think we are there. Um, so hi everyone, um, I am Evelyn Prim, the communications coordinator for the city and I am presenting the results of the uh, fiscal year 25 budget priorities survey. Uh, we just finished um, on December 13th. Um, so just a quick um, overview of what we're gonna be talking about. So I'm just gonna give a very brief overview about the survey, um, its purposes and goals, um, some demographic uh, characteristics that we had included in the survey, um, some advantages and limitations that are inherent in the survey, and then um, de describing how to understand the results um, for, for, best, um, for best use, 
and then uh, run through the questions and the, and the answer results. So about the survey. So we hosted the survey on our Zen City project platform, the community project portal. We opened it on November 13th of this year and it closed December 13th, so it was open for just over a month. Um, so the Zen City pl project platform has a lot of um, options for us. It's one of the, the main reasons that why we decided to, to move forward with that is because we could host these um, more complex survey questions or survey uh, styles and have a lot of different um, options built in. So um, one, of the, one of the security features that it had is uh, for survey validity. Um, we were able to enable um, basically to discourage people from taking it for multiple responses. So for instance, anyone um, could log in to take the survey uh, and they were not asked to provide any sort of um, verification on who they were, but the, uh, it collected a, digi a digital fingerprint so it would know if that device um, were to take the survey again. So it's a pretty a, a low barrier way to, to increase um, some validity there. Um, we received just over um, 646 completed submissions, and I put a little asterisk on that because we uh, one of the options that we did not do was to require everyone to answer every survey. Um, you probably all have taken a survey in the past and then go to submit it, and then it says it can't submit because um, you know you didn't complete them all. Um, and for me, that's that's kind of frustrating because then I have to scroll back and forth and find the one that I didn't um, that I didn't click on. So we wanted, again, this to be open-ended and allow people to not force an opinion onto any option if they chose not to. So for instance, if I just wanted to um, uh, answer the first 10 questions and then skip the last two, that was an option that people could have. Um, and so another n really uh, great feature about this survey is we're able to see on the answers of every survey um, or every uh, question, how many people completed that answer. So it gives us um, a, a really good cross-section of the, uh, the sample size that um, answered the specific questions. Um, and all of, the, all of that is included. It's not um, listed in, in here in this presentation just for uh, to save space. But if you access the, uh, the digital uh, report that's published on our Zen City platform, it's also published on our website, um, you can see the breakdown of uh, all that data right there. And um, I did print out a, a few extra copies uh, if anybody wants a paper copy of that too. So it's, it's up here on this desk. Um, all right. So the purpose and goals of the survey, so as a, a leadership team, we sat down and, and really talked about how we wanted to um, bring people into this budget process. As everybody knows, this is um, probably the most challenging year we've had so far. Um, and even, even in the, the year and a half that I've been here, I can see how much of a challenge this, uh, this has been to uh, folks that have been here much longer than I. So we really wanted to, to make the community part of that process. So uh, we started basically asking the same questions that we all asked ourselves. Where can we focus uh, our limited resources to to um, maximize the gains. Um, and so engaging people in the process was our number one priority for, for why um, we were, or why we chose to do the survey in the first place. Um, and then the second is obviously to learn about community members' expressed priorities uh, to help you all um, in your decision-making process um, to, to understand a better um, cross-section of what uh, people are feeling in the moment. Um, and then also there's some, some limitations to that as well. Um, uh, that I'll get to uh, in the next slide. Um, so some demographic uh, questions that we asked. So we got, one of them was that we asked if people owned or rented their home and we had the option of people could choose another option or prefer not to answer. So 86%, uh, just over 86% of the respondents to this survey reported that they owned their own home. Um, and this is quite different than the actual um, population of Montpelier. So that um, is one of the, the biggest limitations of this survey is that it, uh, we saw just a, a, a lot more um, homeowners answer this than renters. And in the uh, description of the limitations in the uh, report that I passed around, I, I go into detail on to, to why that is and how to account for that as we're interpreting the results. Um, and a, another question that we asked is, uh, is which age bracket represents you best? And so you can see here that the 
majority of uh, folks that took the survey were between the ages of 65 and 74, with a pretty decent um, third and fourth ranking of the 45-54 age group and 35-44. So overall, um, a fairly even split, except um, in the 18 to 24 and 25 to 34, um, were slightly underrepresented as well. Excuse me, everyone, before we get past that, um, do you know, did, did, you, did you do a cross check with uh, census data to see how close this is to I our did, population? I did not, but I can definitely do that and then do a comparison for Cause, sure. Because that would be kind of interesting, I think. Absolutely. We have some of that data in the report we got about the rec center. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. can put those two together. Definitely. No, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, also, to go ahead. Can you tell us what the percentage is? Um, it says, yes. uh, you know, it's like it's under 25, but is that 15, 20? Is yeah, so the, so the green one there looks, I would say that's about 20%. And so the other ones would be about 18 to 19, 17, 18-ish. Really close. Yeah. Really Again, if you access this online, it, if you hover your cursor over it, it'll, it, it gives you like the exact amount. So it's pretty, it's pretty nice. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, can you, where is this online? So if you go to our homepage, the right underneath, there's the, the, the flood information. Uh, it, right underneath the budget, it's the community project portal. And if you go in there, you'll see all the tiles of the different projects that we have, and it's under the FY25 budget tile. It's in the engagement. Uh, I went to the annual budget, I don't see and it. I couldn't, I, I got sent to this agenda in order to get this part of your survey. And then on the that same home page on the far yeah. right under the budget was FY budget, but wasn't the actual. I don't Yeah, see so the survey is within that. It's like a it's like a nesting doll. What's that? So if yeah. you go, are you on? Yeah, I'm on the. I'm on are the you on the home page? Project portal. Okay. Um, FY so you, 25 budget. budget. Yep. Scroll into there. So scroll down, and you should see the engagements. Did you click engagements. On, did you click yeah. on the portal on the FY 25 budget link? Yeah. 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 It's, it's right here. She's there. Yeah. What? I don't see engagements. I don't know what what you mean by engagements. I don't see that word anywhere here. Okay. Well, I can. Um, I'd be happy to do a t tutorial after I've, I'm, I'm done this. Okay. Or if you want to people, yeah. There are yeah. probably people who are watching calls. this oh, who would like to know questions. where it is. Of course. Yeah. Let's not get sidetracked. Yeah. Right? But okay. I do think people want to have access to this information. Definitely. And also, too, I, I didn't mention this um, as of yet, but I was going to mention it at the end. So the other huge half of this survey is we had an open-ended question where we asked people to share their thoughts on anything they, they wanted to, basically. And we got, um, I have 29 pages printed out of thoughts. So <laughs> there's going to be a lot of data analysis that I'm going to be doing over the next couple of, of, uh, of weeks just to, to process all of that. Um, and so with that will come a second installment of this, um, uh, the report basically. And then that, I'll absolutely make sure that that's featured front and center when I have the whole thing um, packaged up. Packaged up. Um, all right, any other questions before I move on? All right. Um, so yeah, so again, mentioning the um, advantages and, and limitations. So um, you also, you may notice in the, just I chose to feature a lot of infrastructure photos because that has been the, um, by far the, uh, the most advocated for thing in, in this budget and all the different um, avenues that people have been able to, to share their thoughts with us. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, so some of the advantages to this uh, survey, it was available um, both in paper and online. So you could take it online or you could stop by here at the Senior Center or at City Hall and take the survey um, right there, uh, pen, pen to paper. So we made it as, as accessible as, as possible. Um, it also, uh, we use multiple um, metrics for interpretation. Uh, so again, there's a lots of different, if, you, if either of you um, had taken the survey, you'll see there's lots of different styles of questions. Um, and so we really wanted to, again, to make that um, as dynamic as possible to get the answers that are gonna be the most helpful to you all. Um, and also to uh, increase public knowledge in the budget process. As I mentioned in the beginning, one of the, the biggest reasons that we chose to do this survey is to just um, to, to bring people into this process, to see the types of decisions that you all are making and we all are making, um, and to, to really use that as an opportunity to increase um, our community's knowledge just on, on how their tax dollars are, are spent and decided on. 
Um, and then again, an opportunity for dialogue. So the survey, I, I talk about this a lot too in, in, other, um, in other areas, but uh, my position specifically, my position, I, I really focus on two-way communication. So it is not just, um, you know, we're asking a question, you give an answer, and it's a done deal. Um, this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, so I encourage in, um, in follow-up and whenever people had questions about this survey to, to, you know, to reach out to their counselor or to reach out to us. Um, and if they had something that, that they'd like to share that didn't fit into either of the brackets, to, to tell us. So that was just one of the, uh, the thoughts going forward um, into this that we really um, emphasized. And then so again, some, some limitations. Obviously, no survey is perfect. Um, again, we saw the, the dem how the demographics don't exactly line up with our population. So just taking that into consideration when you're understanding the results. Um, yeah, that's it. It's skewed more towards homeowners. Um, and distribution um, was limited due to the flood. So one of the, uh, the ways that we had advertised the survey is on public bulletin boards around town. And as you know, we lost a lot of those during the flood. Um, so a lot of coffee shops that used to have bulletin boards no longer do, or some coffee shops aren't even open um, that, that don't. Um, so that, that is a, also a limitation as, um, as well. Um, and then it, also, as I mentioned earlier, incomplete responses. So because we allowed people not to, um, to, we didn't require people to answer every single question, not everybody did. So for instance, the first question we had almost 700 people answer it, and the last couple, um, just over 300 people answered it. So again, just thinking about that when you're looking at the, uh, at the answers and making, drawing conclusions from them. Um, so how to understand the results. Um, so f just as I had mentioned, so um, one of the good best practices of survey, uh, understanding survey results is in, rather than saying, you know, 45% of Montpelier residents rated infrastructure as the most important city priority, um, emphasizing that the number of the, it's the survey responses, uh, respond, respondents um, that rated that. So again, just some nuance in just when we're making, um, drawing conclusions from the results. Um, and so why is that? For all the reasons in our limitations. Um, and then so also just to, uh, notes to remember, this is one of the, the survey is one of the many tools that city staff are using to inform the budget process. So um, we are not just taking the answers of the survey um, and that's our only consideration. Obviously there's way more that goes into this process than um, just a survey, but we wanted to, to emphasize that this complements all the decisions that the um, city leaders um, are making. And that we also wanted to balance um, the express preferences with what's actually possible. Um, obviously, people um, may have really strong um, feelings that, uh, uh, you know, for, for one option, but it just might not be um, a, a possibility for one reason or another. So just taking that into consideration as well. And as I mentioned before, um, the survey is a beginning of a conversation. Um, so the in, onto the questions. Now we're actually at the survey. Um, so the first question we asked people to rank on a matrix their uh, preference for um, their first through twelfth priority um, based on all these different categories. Um, so the way that you understand this question is so this is a table. So the higher you go, the closer you get to one hundred percent. And then it's a little difficult to see here, but the colors represent different um, different um, departments. Some are projects, but the sort of the big ticket items in the budget. And so the the best way to understand this is if you take column one and you see that big brown chunk, you look for what's what's the largest. Um, that's in, that's the public works, operations, plowing, paving, and street maintenance, right at the top of that uh, that graph. So. If you're looking at that, I, it looks like just about, just over 45% of respondents ranked that as their top priority. And then so you can go all the way down and look at the different colors and see which one is the biggest. Um, and again, if you're online and you're, you're hovering over, you can see how uh, the exact uh, percentages of each of these. Uh, but you can see the trends. So if you're looking um, from left to right, you can see how the colors sort of uh, even out on a downward slope. Um, so that actually tells me that uh, most of the people um, tend to agree on, on a lot of these things, if the way, uh, just based on the way that people have ranked them. Um, so the top three were public works, basically public works at the top 
top two. Uh, we broke it into operations and projects, and then third was public safety, fire, and EMS, and a very close second was um, public safety, uh, police, and dispatch. Um, so the next question we had, uh, we asked people to um, how they would address the current city budget, and we had four options there, and the pretty much uh, just about two thirds, so a third for each, um, ranked um, as uh, cutting city spending by cutting programs and services and uh, raising taxes and revenues and cutting programs at the same time. So another interesting breakdown there. Um, another top three, this, so this one, um, we asked if, uh, if they had chose uh, to cut city spending and programs, um, where should the city make those cuts? So basically really asking people to, uh, to prioritize based on a limited number of resources here. So again, the top three for um, where they would make cuts based on the uh, list that we had here were, um, the top two were basically some, some net zero activities and indoor recreation. Were there uh, dollar amounts associated with these choices in the survey? There were not, but what we this all these items came from the last. Um, some of you would, would remember the um, the city projects um, presentation that I gave uh, about six seven months ago now, um, and so all of those projects were listed as either they were um, uh, a project that's that's currently in the works or is. Um, being considered by a committee or a city group, um, so that's where those that's where those categories came from. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, and then in the following set of questions, we asked people to rank um, to increase, decrease, or maintain the current funding for each project uh, or department on the list. Um, so for the public restroom, um, forty-two percent. Um, reported to to maintain it, and that is the trend going pretty much consistently throughout is maintaining funding, just to, to spoiler alert. Um, but you then hear this one, you can see uh, in the total number of responses there down the bottom, bottom right, 650 people responded to this question. Um, and then you can see in the, the breakdown of, of how many um, either uh, increase, maintain, or decrease. Um, and then the homelessness facility, uh, people also at 37%. Um, voted to maintain that as well. And you can see slightly less answered that question. That was uh, 647 people. Um, and then so for street maintenance, uh, over 50% uh, um, chose to maintain it. Um, in the Senior Activity Center, over 55, almost 56% um, voted to, chose to maintain it as well. And then for the Recreation and New Community Center. 59% um, chose to decrease funding for that one. And again, you can see the total number of responses slightly dropping off there at 636, the further we go down. Um, capital improvement projects, 53% um, re responded to increase um, spending in that one, um, with 42% uh, maintaining it. And then for parks, uh, 59, almost 60% uh, again maintaining and 35% uh, decreasing it. Uh, for public safety police dispatch, 61% uh, um, responded to, uh, ma to maintain. And uh, again, you can see the numbers there dropping off quite a bit at uh, only uh, 362 uh, res total responses. Um, and then for uh, the last one, um, public safety, fire, and EMS. 69% uh, um, choosing to maintain there. Um, so that is a really quick run through of, the, of those survey results. Like I said, I have 29 pages of answers to, um, to analyze, uh, which then I'll be coming back with a, a more polished document to, uh, to explain and, and code some of those answers to hopefully pull, again, some bigger themes uh, from those answers. And uh, so for people to, to learn more, so I will double check and make sure that it is, free, uh, there's a, a quick button to get to it on the homepage, but you should be able to go to the community project portal on the homepage, look for the FY2025 budget tile, 
Um, and then also we'll be following up with the budget YouTube videos. Uh, we did um, the administration budget today, uh, so you can look for that. Hope, I'm hoping to have it fit, done editing by tomorrow, so it should be up there by the end of the week, if not tomorrow, or if not sooner. And then absolutely everything is linked to our website somewhere, and if you can't find it, please reach out to me, um, eprim at montpelier-vt.org, um, or you can come, come find me in City Hall. Yeah. Thanks, Evelyn. This yes. is super interesting. Um, questions? Go ahead, Carrie. Thank you so much. This is really helpful. I'm, I'm really curious about the exact numbers on some of these things, so I'm looking forward to being able to find it on the website, which I, I cannot do right now. Um, but I'm wondering if you, do you have the detailed information with you right now? Of the, of all the responses? Yeah. Yes, I do. Could you, would you mind just giving us on the, the, um, the priorities and values where people kind of ranked their one through 12 priorities? Would you mind just kind of reading the, the one, two, and three priorities? Because I can't really, I can't really tell by the colors all yes. the different things. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, but I so, want to know, like, but all of okay. them. I want to know how many people said public works and how many people said parks and all let of that. Let me uh, let me pull it up online. If my computer will cooperate. So 294 respondents ranked their number one priority as public works operations. And that's 43%. And what were the other, and the the others, other number ones? The other number ones were at So public works um, improvement, uh, so the capital improvement projects, that one is 18% of the number one responses. Right. So it's, it's a little right, right. screwy when you try to understand no, it. I understand. Um, and then uh, let's see, 14% fire and EMS. And what were the, the other ones? For, for number, one. uh, number two choice? Or for number one, no, what, oh, what number else? One. Yeah, um, so then just going down the list. Could you easily share your screen so people can see yeah, that what that's going to Or if you can email it, I can just read it. I don't, yes. I don't need to take everyone's time to see it. I just want to be able to see it. Yep. It's actually, it's the way it's showing me, it's, it's very, very tiny, so I don't think Showing my screen is going to make that much of okay. Okay. better, but um, I will when I get back to my office. I'll I can okay. take a screenshot and yes, and blow it up. All right, um, okay, so then so that was third choice, fourth place, uh, police <coughs> at nine percent, housing at eight percent, parks at two percent, MSAC at two percent. And then everything else is um, one or less than one percent of one okay. of the first percent. Okay, so that's that's enough. That's fine. Right. That's, okay, I appreciate that. It's helpful. Yeah. No, there's a lot of data, and that's again what's one of the kind of the beauties of this this data this platform is there is a lot of data. It's just taking the time to package it and put it into a way that's understandable to everybody. Done. Well, well, likewise, uh, like one on the page of the public restrooms and homeless facility, the increase was one of, but was 213 and maintained was 277. That's a huge amount that says what we need to do as well as the homeless facility. Yeah. It's the same thing. They're both 
almost within a third of people who voted. That's huge. That's a, and that's a really good point of, of a, another really good way to understand the results. Is well, and that's a part of our question. Of the, yeah. So when we get back more from you, is it going to have some of that perception, not just who's what's top? Because top doesn't tell the real whole picture. Correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for the presentation and your uh, hard work. My question is, did we ask participants if they have seen the budget presentation or the numbers? We did not ask that. That's a really good, that's a good well, question yeah, to ask. Well, they would have because this was in advance yeah. of presenting yeah, the budget. That, and that was my yeah. point <laughs> because I took the survey before seeing the budget numbers. Yeah. And now the survey makes different thing to me. So I think this survey is good to understand general perspective of residents, what they think about items. But this one doesn't represent the uh, FY25 budget Absolutely. for me. So maybe next time we can switch the uh, places that we can talk about the numbers first mm -hmm. and do the survey. Or we can put, I don't know, a link before the uh, survey, and everybody should see the numbers because mm -hmm. when they talk about cut, right? What does they that mean? Yeah, they don't know yep. how many um, you know dollars or or when when they say increase. Exactly. At least uh, as a um, survey taker, I didn't know that. What is the percentage in budget? What is the number? Can we do this or not? So I think it will be better if people. Um, see the numbers first, then answer the questions. Yeah. And we is exactly something we talked about about doing as well. As yeah. We ha we ended up deciding to go with it before just just to kind of get that like snapshot in time pulse of, of what the community is thinking. And we also talked about doing a follow up survey. So now that we do have numbers, we have the avail have the yeah. uh, the capacity to put together another survey based on what we're actually dealing with. So mm -hmm. yeah, really good good question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just want to weigh in on that a little bit too. Um, as Evelyn said at the beginning of the presentation, this is this is one part of the decision making process. This isn't the be all and end all. This was a follow up to the community survey we did last year, which we presented the results. We had a sense of what was important to the community then, uh, and it was also in response to a request from the council to try to get some early information before we started the pro you know the budget process. So to get to be informed of what the, the public was thinking as you make decisions. So this is. You know, the, the, the general public is probably not going to have the same level of detail as far as budget lines, but they know what they like and they don't like and what they want to see more of and less of. And I think that was the point we used. We didn't have the final results because it was still open, but we used the results that we had in trying to at least understand as we made our own uh, budget decisions and pre presentations. For example, the capital plan fully funded and cuts in rec and those kind of things reflecting the priorities here. Um, but. You know, at the end of the day, now we have a full public process where we provide public information is what's in the budget, all that's online, all that's available, uh, and um, public hearing process, and of course a vote. The biggest survey of all is the, is the first Mar Tuesday in March when people uh, get to say how they feel about all of it. So, Anybody else have any questions or comments about this before we move on? Thanks, Evelyn. I think this is. Yeah. I think this, Steve Whitaker, I think this is a really powerful tool, and we should think about whether we want to do this, whether we want to cultivate an understanding am, am, amongst the community of how important and powerful this could be if we do it twice a year, you know, or do it and break it into subsections and do it more frequently and, and hold little workshops in senior center, different constituencies to teach them how to do it online so that we get maximum engagement because this is the way you can drive zero-based budgeting. This is the way to really get a, a pulse on what priorities are and they will shift frequently uh, based on emergency. So I think we've, we've found a good tool to use, but we have only begun to scratch the surface of the potential of engagement and frequency to drive decision making. Yeah, George. So I'd like to amplify what Steve said. I, uh, I, I like his point. I also 
agree with Palin. I think that we need to start the budget, budget process a little earlier. I think the cart is before the horse. Um, this is a little bit late now. And I think if you're going to do an FY25, you need to be starting at a zero-based budget and have the discussion earlier about what the budget's going to be in that process. And then the surveys can come later. Because now you've got low-information voters out there. And you need to have people informed. So I really feel like we need to switch the way you set up the budget process. Thanks. Just to that point, I would add, um, we did have a budget discussion in October where we went through preliminaries, asked the council for, for uh, guidance and public input. And that, at that point is when they said we would like to see if we can get some more public input in advance of our budget process, which launched this survey. Uh, and then also been doing work on setting priorities and uh, getting that out. And we obviously, everything is runs off the March town meeting date and uh, we don't have a lot of information about state funding and those kind of things until late. So it always is gonna, gonna change. So the budget process, when it is, is but getting public input on it all year round is really important. It's one of the reasons why we wanted to go to this, this so we can continually survey people on priorities and on. Yeah, there's, there's only so early we can start it because you know, fiscal year starts July 1st. Uh, if we started it too far, too early, we and in fact, I think I think some of us were busy with other things in July and August, but <laughs> in September. But uh, but start too early, people aren't. We don't have that much data about what's happened in the current budget year. Um, but it's not a survey that starts that. Your budget process that you started. Right. You can start that budget process early. Be earlier than October, I'm saying. That's what my point is. Okay. You can start that process earlier and get those, that information to the voters. Too. Okay. Th any other council members have any comments or questions before we move on to the, to the main act? All right. We are moving on to. If I may, Mr. Yes, Mayor, between, between, budget, uh, between agenda items, just response to an earlier question, uh, the city has spent, spent $3 million on the purchase of the property at the Elks Club, spent $161,000 uh, in development costs that included the entire public process and the, the master plans that were created and approved. We also have operating uh, costs and revenues, uh, lease, et cetera. So uh, I don't have the detail on those, but we've netted about 2,400 to the positive, so we've taken more in than spent on that. Uh, but that was as of the end of September. Um, and then we had some FEMA-related costs that are in the FEMA reimbursement fund. Uh, so that's the expenditures on that site. Thanks. Um, all right, now we're up to item Eight, which is the uh, fiscal 2025 budget. And where we are right now is where we ask the, uh, the city administration to put us, which is to basically develop a budget that uh, has a target of the uh, rate of inflation. And uh, there's a number of ways we can approach it from this point. And one of the things we can do is we can just uh, go through and add and subtract things and see what, uh, where we come out. But I'd be interested in seeing if now, now that you've, we've had a chance to digest the budget a little bit, if, uh, what, what kind of target do we have in mind? Are people happy with the, uh, uh, a target of uh, maintaining taxes at the rate of inflation? Are people interested in uh, going lower than that? Are people interested in being at being higher because they think our priorities or our needs are are greater uh, than that? And so, I'd, I'd like like it if we can at least have that discussion. I don't know if we're gonna come to agreement on that. Tim. Yeah, Jack, maybe for process, because we've listened a lot. We listened to Bill's presentation and to folks, certainly since the last meeting, there's been a lot of comment and feedback, but I'd love to hear what city council members are thinking in the process. Maybe could we just like go around the table and get impressions before we dive into choosing a, a percentage increase? Well, sure, that's kind of what I thought we were doing, but, but yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, so, 
Do you want to start by saying what your yeah, pre process is? You want me to start? I well, okay. I, I don't want to put you on the spot. If you're no, I'm glad to. I, I think um, looking at this, trying to figure out how to get it to be a discussion about um, the process. I mean, I know there's been a process that's been in place that's worked in the past, but I'm not sure it feels like it's working to me. Um, I think our priorities, which this survey just emphasized, are the key areas. Our primary mission is, you know, police and fire, you know, ambulance, public works, and those are our primary mission. And then it feels like the other departments and, and things we do are kind of extracurricular, secondary, um, you know, rec, uh, parks, senior center, and uh, social justice. So it, it feels a little to me like a, the old classic mild wide and an inch deep. You know, we're just like cutting a little from everything and not necessarily looking. There's, are we doing it right? And as I listened last time, especially the, the one on the fire department presentation really got me. And so I'd like to know more about basically the primary mission items first. And we should look at those departments and determine, are we doing this right? You know, why, why are we looking at a 1.2 to $1.5 million piece of equipment coming up that we've known was coming up for 25 years, but we have no reserves? Um, we lost another fire truck in a, in a tragic fire recently. Haven't heard anything about it other than a brief mention from the fire chief at the last meeting that we're waiting for insurance on what we lost for equipment on it. But because there's really been nothing about the truck, it makes me wonder, do we really need it? Um, you know, you look at cutting staff, and the way this is working is we're, this proposal for the budget would be cutting people that aren't working for us right now. It's open positions, right? So it would be like not, we're taking somebody at the service end of the ladder, um, but then if we don't hire them, we're gonna be paying overtime to people that are further up the ladder. It, I just would like to know more about the whole overtime thing, because it sounds like, it, you know, if we're cutting someone at this level and we're paying two or three times that to fill overtime, that just doesn't feel like a good move. Maybe we're not doing that, but it seems like it. Um, so that, that was one example, but I feel like we also need to look at police. Public works feels like we're always behind the, the eight ball. And I'd rather invest in those key areas of service that we're supposed to be providing and then the other things we do are good things, but the, if we have to look at adjustments, maybe they need to be in those areas. So that's my first impression of having kind of listened through and trying to piece this together on my first city council budget. <laughs> so. And when you talk about public works, you're encompassing capital within that. Absolutely, Clearly, yeah. water lines, sewer lines, streets, yeah. yes. I guess I, I, I agree with uh, a lot of that. I mean, one of the things that jumped out at me is that the, I mean, the open positions are easy to, easy to, to cut, but they, I, th I think we can be more strategic about it. I mean, they're, they're fundamental services that the city provides, right? I mean, the infrastructure, um, police, fire, EMS, and we're, uh, we're not, we're leaving those position shorthanded and we're we're adding overtime um, almost two hundred and eighty thousand dollars in overtime so it, it it doesn't seem to be um, as strategic as it as it can be it seems like uh, it it gets us to a number but I'm not sure it gets us there um, in an ideal way okay Fair. So one of the things that really struck me about the survey results that we just got that lines up with what I've definitely been hearing from people contacting me is people don't want to see cuts to public works, they don't want to see cuts to public safety. Um, and so, I, and, I, and I agree that those are core services that the city provides. So, so I'm uncomfortable with staff cuts to those departments. Um, I would prefer to, if we need to make cuts, that we find them somewhere else. Um, I'm also, I'll just let you all know that I'm, I'm not going to be opposed to a higher tax increase than is in the current budget proposal. I'm not necessarily saying I'm going to argue for that, just I'm open to that. Um, because I've, I think preserving our ability to provide these core services is, is it's what we're here for. It's the whole point of city government. Um, so I would like to look at um, 
I have a zillion notes here in this giant book, um, many of which are probably just not necessarily going to have a huge impact, but I think we should talk about some of those little things that we can save. Like, for instance, the city council budget is up like 10% or something like that. And I think in a, in a year when we're trying to, to, to restrain ourselves, it's not a lot of money that the city council budget includes, but we should try to find ways to cut that. Um, and, and then if we have to, anyway, so I, I guess we'll stop there. But just say that I want to try to preserve those public works and public safety and capital improvement. Okay. Investments. Thanks. Donna, do you have a? Uh, sure. Uh, I likewise don't have a percentage in mind, and but I and I agree with the, the core services. However, I have the advantage of having spent a lot of time hearing from all the departments, and I feel even with those recordings, it's not perhaps not the same. I, I really feel for members who've come on the last two years and between the pandemic and the flood, we haven't had that indulgence. Uh, because I have such a solid respect and understanding of how those departments run that I don't need to dis dissemble them. And if they say they can do without a position, I trust their judgment. Uh, likewise, overtime is an issue. I brought it up, I think, before anybody else. But by the same token, I know that $280,000 is, what, one or two positions with all the benefits? <laughs> So sometimes overtime is the cheaper way. Um, but I do also feel like those are not our only core. I do think the rec department and the parks, there's a, a balance there because they're a part of our quality of life and for young people and younger adults. The survey strikes me of just how many are over 35, 40, <laughs> over 50. Uh, and that's a, likewise, the senior centers are in there. Uh, they don't want to be forgotten. So I. I uh, I'm not opposed to making some severe cuts, but I don't feel it's just supporting public works. That's all. Thanks. Uh, Lauren. Sure. Um, so, I mean, just higher level to start. I mean, I, I think I'm more like Carrie and Donna. I don't have a percent in mind. I just, I know we're all wrestling with this tension of how do we provide the best services and keep taxes reasonable for people. And so I, I don't know what that number is, but um, I would be comfortable potentially with a little more if it's going to provide the kinds of services that the community needs right now. Um, what I'm concerned about is decisions that might be penny wise and pound foolish, things that are, that are in a few years even gonna cost us more, or if it's cutting staff positions that cost more in overtime or things like that. So I think that kind of analysis of you know what are the cuts we're making things that are not going to end up setting us back or projects that are going to cost double in five years and, and that kind of thing that um, seem like n not great decisions to make. Um, a few, I was just scanning before this meeting for just the, the community impact uh, input that I'm sure we've all been getting lots of emails and it's just another data point in addition to the survey, which is great. So like the things that, you know, Fire and police, there were some great stories and things of just how critical for people's lives and safety and, and some great, I think, stories and um, just sharing how valuable those services are for folks. Um, roads, of course. Uh, definitely heard from a number of people saying holding off on a new rec center given the budget pressures in this immediate fiscal year. Um, a lot of people supporting the bridge <laughs> as a uh, communications tool. Uh, so those were just some of the, uh, the things that I saw from community outreach in the last couple weeks. Um, I mean, for the staffing, I mean, I, I really agree with what Carrie had said. I mean, we had done for the police review committee a really detailed analysis of staffing levels. And this was a group that I would say a number of folks came into that thinking, we're probably overstaffed in our police department and we probably have room to cut. That's a big part of our budget and this seems outsized. And we did a really deep analysis of looking at that budget, staffing levels, how do you maintain basic, like really just basic number of people on staff for all the hours of the day that we need. And they were like, the number that we have is the right number. And so to me, cutting that seems problematic. Like, I, again, it's convenient to say, you know, people who aren't there right now, but it, it seems like the kind of thing where that's, like, where we've landed, I think, is a good number of staffing. So I would like to see that 
restored if we are able to. Um, I haven't seen the same analysis for the fire department. Um, DPW, I know a couple of years ago we talked about last time, we cut staff and then we had to bring people back because it was not providing the services and we see in all these survey, surveys and so many conversations that Public Works is where people want us to be focusing even more time, so cutting staff there seems tricky. Um, so, you know, and, and then if you try to put those numbers in, it's, it's hard <laughs> to do that. So I recognize it's this, this, this big tension that we have. Um, I think, um, you know, one idea I was thinking about that I was just kind of brainstorming last week, but I could see us putting in some pot of money for our commi city committees that are basically zeroed out across the board that is smaller than the collective of what we normally put in, but that would allow projects to go forward. I think there's, you know, in any given year, opportunities, grant programs, and things where you do need a little city match, a little um, city contribution in order to access much bigger money that could benefit the community and allow these committees to continue doing work. So um, I might put a little more thought into what that might look like and come forward with an idea. So just just um, naming that. I know my ride is zeroed out. Zeroed out. I want to talk to Senator Perchlick on the Transportation Committee uh, and see if there's possibility for the state to subsidize that this year, given our budget crunch. Um, you know, other things like lobbying. I understand cutting that, and it's a year where we need state money more than ever. So, you know, I mean, I'll commit with, and then maybe Bill and Jack will. Next year, not this year. But they're working on their fiscal year 25 budget, too. So it's the same. Right, but I mean, we would have the person for this legislative session. Oh, we paid for that in this? Yes. In the oh, good. Okay. That's that, gives me, that gives me some comfort. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that, like, I do feel like Jack and you, and I'm happy to do it, too, and Carrie's there all the time, like, committing to being up there a lot this year because I think we need it. That's good. That's good. We do do. Like, we need them to really support us. So um, so anyway, I, I, I know that what I've just said adds up to adding a lot more into the budget, so I'm interested in looking at are there other places to, to potentially um, cut to keep taxes reasonable, um, and you know, it's just this, again, just back to like this really challenging moment we're in of how do we provide services that we want and keep taxes as a reasonable rate for our community. Uh, Jack, can I add one thing? Yeah. I, I forgot my ride. I'm so glad you brought it up because it is unfair to cut that. We spend millions on the roads, and the only thing that gives a lot of our residents access to those roads is public transportation. And I think my ride is very important, and so I wouldn't like to see that cut. Thank you for bringing that up. Phelan. Um, so I agree most of the things um, other city councilors mentioned, and I know that how important all our city initiatives to make Montpelier what it is. But after the flood and also before that COVID, things have changed. So we have so many cores, but some core services are more important than others. That's why I really want to see no cut in public safety. I mean, police, fire, and also um, public works. If there is no public safety, then we cannot talk about other things, right? So we need to have a safe town to build other things on top of it. I think as a city and city council, we need to find other items to cut if we need a cut. And for tax increase, again, I think we should ask residents how much increase they can pay. Like, can they pay 5% increase? They can pay 10%. Um, and there's the question, it, is, it shows the reality, right? Some people said, increase the tax, also make the cut. So they are ready to uh, commit, right, the city's um, vision, but also they need to see some cuts, so there will be a balance. And uh, since Lauren mentioned bridge, it is another thing. Uh, I know that Time Argus is asking for uh, less money, but if we think the, uh, how much bridge um, reaches out to residents, Montpelier residents, I think it is more important to use that specific budget really to inform our residents, so we should consider that item too. But again, everything we do, I believe that we should do, but at least for next three years, we have to choose 
what are the most important services for us. And our main services as a city is the public safety, fire, and public works. Okay, thanks. I, I, I thought this was uh, a very interesting survey. Uh, survey results were great. You know, for, for as long as I've been on the council and, and even before, what, what I've said a lot is, you know, people in Montpelier really value the uh, services they get from their city government. And that's reflected in the fact that year after year they come out, out and they support the budget. Um, but it's also just demonstrated by the fact that what all of us find when we, when we talk to our neighbors. And if we look at this survey, um, what I was struck by is that there is very, you know, people said, well, uh, uh, a good chunk of people said raise revenue by raising taxes and cutting services. And uh, a good ch chunk said uh, cut services uh, and programs. But on the other, then we look at, well, what do people want to do with our services? And right down the line, it's pretty much maintain them or increase them. And, uh, and I think that people are telling us they want the services that the, the city is giving them. And we, we don't do any, we don't provide any services. The city doesn't do anything without getting money from the taxpayers and, uh, and spending that money on those services. So it's, uh, when we're, we're faced with the two questions of one, how much money should we be spending? And two, what should we be spending it on? Well, I, I, people are mostly telling us, keep spending the money on the things we're spending it on. And there are probably some adjustments to be made there. But uh, I, I think it's very clear from the uh, emails we're getting, you know, we, we hear way more about uh, about public works than anything else. You know, we got a big outcry about the about the bridge, but over the course of the, you know, that's, and I don't discount that just because uh, a lot of people came out to say that. That's that's valid ex expression of people's wishes. But over the course of the whole year, we all know. We hear about the public works and the roads, and, and that's a very, very important uh, factor. And, and the idea of uh, not, uh, not maintaining or increasing that is, is really uh, hard to picture. Um, in, we've had years in the past where part of the budget process has been to get uh, department heads in to talk to us about uh, here, here's what we what we want, and here's the uh, here's how we arrived at these uh, at these proposals, and we didn't set that up to to happen tonight, but uh, we could certainly bring the department heads in to uh, to do that at our next meeting, if uh, if people are interested in hearing that, because some of us who've been on the council for a long time, have heard that more than once. Uh, some of you who have not been on the council. Haven't haven't had that had the benefit of that uh, that kind of presentation, and I, and I think there's a real value to that. Um, uh, so I'd like to just get uh, a, a thumbs up kind of thing. Is, is that something you'd be interested in having uh, having us do at our next meeting? Have, having the department heads the department, you know, yeah. come in and say, Here, here's our needs and here's, what, uh, here's how we arrived at that. Um, so that? I, I remember there were videos last year and there were videos being prepared. Is that what those videos are doing? So uh, yes, and I think, uh, I'm not trying to sway you one way or the other, but just historic perspective. So what's typically happened is, at least in the larger, well, 
we've sometimes had everybody, but certainly with the larger departments, it's your opportunity to ask the kind of questions. So you can see the video and just say, you know, here's how many people we have, here's what it's up here's what's down here's what our needs are but then it's a chance to ask you know can you get you know what does this mean what's the impact so if you want to have all or some of the folks in to talk about the impact of these presentations um, it you know it has been a good opportunity it's been a number of years since it's been done so the, the questions that people have raised like well if we cut what does that do to overtime and and how do you manage overtime in light of reduced staffing that uh, kind of it'd be, question. It's helpful to me to have, have that conversation with the people who are actually uh -huh. going to have to manage that. Okay, situation. Carrie and then Helen. So uh, I think there might be some departments that I might have benefit from being able to ask those questions. You, not all of them. I don't. I don't. I would rather not take the time to have every single department make a presentation to us and hear about it. I think that with the videos and um, and the information in here. There's a lot of information in here, very detailed. Um, I, I do have some specific questions. I, I imagine that Bill can probably answer most of my questions. But also, things like overtime, I mean, I did a little bit of the math in there. And so you can, you can do that math if you want to. And you can see where cutting a position saves this much money and adds this much in overtime. And I, I kind of trust that they've done that math. But if we have specific questions, um, It'd be great to hear those answers. Um, so I'm wondering about the idea that um, public public works might say we can do without somebody, um, and and I don't I don't know that that's the message that we've gotten. I think we've gotten from the city staff overall. Here's something we've worked out that we can all live with not public works is saying we don't really need that person. Yeah. So I just want to be really clear about that. Pale in and then Tim. Yeah, uh, I would just say that uh, maybe paperwork, just a, like an executive summary from each department, if we are talking about this, then if we need to ask questions, we can have them instead of having all the presentation. I think uh, we need to hear more from public during I know we have two specific public hearings, uh, but let's use that time to discuss um, us discussing things. So if we want to hear from departments, my suggestion would be like an executive summary paperwork or document. Then if we want to ask specific do um, departments questions, then we can invite them. Okay, that's, that's kind of what we have in our book. Yeah, that's what, yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah. But but still, there are, there are big depart some of the big departments where the, where a lot of money is. They, those might we might want to have those department heads come in. I don't know, Tim. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to think of how to get to the questions. I mean, this is kind of layered and nuanced, and I think for us to understand it, and, and people have elected us to do that. Um, I think we need to get our arms around this and our minds around this um, before just opening it up. Because it's, it's, and think questions like trying to determine, and I don't know, but I, so I think if, if I heard from departments, I would want to start with, you know, police, fire, public works, and just get a sense of questions like administratively, are we a little heavy, you know, in places? I mean, because it happens. I mean, we have senior departments and people have been in it a long time, and it can get out of balance. And it's like, how do we discuss that and assess it and understand that we have people at all the right levels to make this work? correctly. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a group decision coming up from the departments when you get to that level. Um, so I, I think those are the kind of pieces we need to find a way to get to to really have a good discussion and understand the budgets. And then, and also we really got to look at our capital budgets and in terms of you know, water lines and sewer lines, but also purchasing equipment. Because uh, we're we've just somehow fallen behind the eight ball on that in, in a big way, both in fire for sure and in public works. Um, I'm not sure on police, but we, we can look at that. Um, but I think we need to have those worked out before we open to the next level of departments. That's yeah. my preference. Yeah. I just sort of want to remind everybody that this budget with this 3.1, is that where we're at, uh, came from a reduction that came from all the department heads through city manager. and. And so that we're, that was like an eight if we didn't do these cuts, 
where was the percentage at? Almost 13. Almost 13? 13%. Okay, so business as usual would, would have been 13%, and we're now here at 3.1. So I just, I just, okay, I just, I just want to remind us where the numbers came from that we have in the book. Started there and worked out, and took maybe small stuff, but it was significant in the bottom line. And the other aspect is that there's a lot of like public opinion right now on the bridge. Part of me wants to say, we can't afford multi-newspapers. In a time when newspapers are failing, we all need to support Times Argus, a regional paper. It's a time for us to be a regional focus. And that maybe we can encourage the good writing that's happening in the bridge go to the Times Argus. At the time of Argus, we have to have it for ads. We have to put public notices in something that publishes on a regular basis. Uh, so we need that paper. And it's the one that's committed to getting people out there to do articles and pictures for schools and lots of events. And so I, I know that's very unpopular to say, but that's the kind of response I have is, OK, we got 12 letters or emails from people supporting the bridge. That's very good. But to me, that's not the whole pulse of the community. Not only that, it's not necessarily good business to, to do that. Um, and I think that's true for some, some of the other decisions we have to make. Back to bigger budget issues. So I think the piece of the percentage is interesting because it's easy to throw those percentage numbers around. Last year was an 8.5% budget. For our properties, resulted in roughly a 17.9% increase. So the, the numbers you throw out at the table, if people think they're getting a 3.2% increase, it's not necessarily that. And we also don't have any handle on the school side of this. So when yeah. the taxpayers are paying their taxes, they get a bill. And it's the city and the schools. And we have to be cognizant of that. It's going to be a bad year for the schools based on education. Funding. And there are other budget items. Yeah, right. They're going to be sitting there. So, so yeah, throwing it out at 3.2, it probably isn't 3.2%. Um, and we shouldn't create that illusion for people. Because you know, right now, we, everybody also wants affordability. That was the biggest word I heard in, in March on the election piece. And you, know, you can't have everything and just keep piling it on and have affordability. I mean, just the increase in property taxes on one property we've got necessitates, and I didn't do it, at least a $60 a month increase in their rent just for the property taxes. That doesn't include the increases in insurance and fuel or anything else, or the floods that hit us. We're, you know, we are really causing, or we're charged with trying to not cause things to be worse for people. And, and I just think throwing a number of like 3.2 out and creating any illusion that that's what people's taxes, no, is, it's I'm wrong. No, I was the comparison where the numbers were and yeah. what has been cut so far. That was all I was trying to do with what this budget. This budget is not without its cuts. That's all I was trying to make to But it's just the baseline. Yes, Rick. because there's so many things on the ballot, it's yeah. way out of our control. But we should be clear mm -hmm. that what we're talking about is an increase in the tax rate of 3.2%. And uh, mm. obviously, of, of all the people in the city, all the property owners in the city uh, went through the uh, reassessment process this year. Um, a bunch of people, their valuation went up to the point where they had an increase in taxes, a bunch of other people, and we're not, we're not hearing complaints from them, but a bunch of, and, and we have not seen those people come to the uh, Board of Civil Authority, of course, because bunch of other people, their valuation went up, but uh, but not as much. And their taxes might have even gone down or not up very much. And so it's it's a, the grand list as a whole and the uh, property as, as a whole that uh, that we're talking about here. But obviously, it hits someone who, who already, who just had a big increase in their uh, evaluation. It's going to hit them harder. There's no question about that. Bill. That's a perfect time. Uh, we do have a couple of updates we wanted to provide you. Is in uh, it's not probably not going to help your uh, decision making any, but uh, we Sarah, I want to have Sarah just give you. We have some updated information since we last met. We now know the amount of the library petition because it's been received, and she's got a calculation of uh, the impact of the decisions the Board of Civil Authority has made to date, uh, and so what that affects the budget. So just so. Um, to make a bad situation worse. Um, thought we'd throw that in there. And then I've got a couple of the comments in general, not to argue for anything. But. Okay. Um, so I 
from the assessor got the Board of Civil Authority reduction so far. They're approximately $7.5 million shaved off of that grand list. Um, so what that equates to is instead of a 3.2% tax increase, it would be a 3.79% tax increase, um, which is roughly, if you were to try to trim that down, that's about $67,000 that would have to come off to get to the 3.2% tax increase based on the revenue increase. Um, that doesn't account for any abatements, any flood loss, or any new builds. So those are potential increases or reductions to the list. Um, and it also doesn't account for um, the big national life question about whether they will get reduced down to what they're asking. And if they do get reduced down another 18.7 million, um, that would equate to a 5.27% tax rate increase. Um, and in addition to that 67,000 I mentioned before, that would be about 167,000 in additional we would need to cut to keep tax revenue at the CPI of 3.2%. Um, and then we did receive the petition for the library and that adjustment took them from $411,774 to $444,070, which is a $32,296 increase or 7.84%. And what did that do if that's added on to the tax rate, just so people know? If that is added on to the tax rate. That's outside of our budget, but it's still part of the municipal tax rate. That is approximately a .002 cent increase, um, which would equate to about $10 for the average home value of 370000 So for people who are not as intimately familiar with this as some of us, um, with, the, with the Board of Civil Authority, what Sarah's talking about is that people have uh, who were dissatisfied with their assessment could come to the Board of Civil Authority, appeal their assessment, and uh, get and try to convince the Board of Civil Authority to reduce that assessment. And the total seven six point seven million. You said? Uh, we've 7. reduced it seven point five million. Seven point five million of all the property taxpayers who come to the Board of Civil Authority, it's reduced in. It's resulted in a reduction of that $7.5 million, and that pushes our taxes up. Yep. Yeah, inherently because, increases the rate. Because our, because our budget is already set. It was set by the voters in March. Well, no, it would be the projected budget for this year. Oh, for next year, year. that's right. That, that we're so. talking about. So if nothing else changed, say you approved the budget as it was presented to you, but it was this grand list, it would be a 3.8% tax rate increase instead of 3.2 based on those. So it's a $67,000 sort of additional cost in the budget. And the national life production, if it happens, would be a future year, right? We would, we would probably won't be settled. If it isn't settled, it would go into a future. That increase would apply to a future year. No, we don't. All of it. They it would, would they get, get a, a refund. refund. They get a re Which we would have to budget in a future year. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah, if uh, the Board of Civil Authority voted to affirm the decision of the assessor on, on national life. Hmm? It did. Yes. And did not reduce national life's assessment. They have the ability to, to go to court and to challenge that. And if they're successful, then whatever they pay in fiscal year 2025 will have to be adjusted. With interest. Yeah. With interest. So one other comment. Thank you, Sierra. One other comment in general. Just uh, I, I know I've said this before, but uh, when you look at the items in the budget, for example, someone mentioned an increase in 280000 those don't necessarily, so we have done the math and tried to figure out what it would take to do the work, but it doesn't necessarily reflect the impact of a particular position, understanding that it reflects newer wage rates, but also the, the probably the most important thing we did other than fully fund capital was to, I, I would say, right size our expenses, get the correct number in. So we had been under budgeting over time, under budgeting some supplies, so it, you know we were able to do other things, but then we would end up spending it. And you know we we say this is the year we think we can manage it better. So what we did was make a real effort to put in the correct numbers 
from the start for, for based on our tr spending trends um, so that we wouldn't get caught in that trap. And that means that we had more reductions to make around the edges or, or all around, but we also want to be realistic about what it really costs to, to run the city. So just... That's we don't. We don't want to be in a position of right. re getting halfway through the year and realize we're overspending. We under, under budget. Yeah, overspending. Right. Charted here. This shows. Like this year. Yeah. Exactly. The budget is and what exactly. we spend. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And, and I'd like to throw another another point into this whole mix, just to be part of the discussion, which is that a, a couple of years ago, the uh, CJAC, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee came up with this instrument that I shared with everyone uh, by email the other day, maybe just last night, uh, which is to look at uh, everything we do in our budget with an eye towards, uh, towards social and economic uh, justice and social and economic equity. And um, the basic idea is, as we're discussing what we're doing in our budget, what impact does that have on uh, on people who are who stand to be hurt the most? And the questions that we're it's not a policy that we've adopted in the city, but it is uh, something that uh, people have considered to be a valuable uh, factor to keep in mind. And and so they came up with three three questions. One, what are the social, economic, and racial justice impacts? of this budget decision on marginalized populations in our community. Two, who will benefit from or be burdened by this particular budget decision? And three, what strategies are there to mitigate any unintended consequences of this budget decision? And if no strategies exist, how will you create them? And one of the things that, uh, that Donna pointed out that was uh, has been in my mind is that uh, I suspect that my ride, if we uh, if we have the information, would we would find that most of the people who use my ride are people who uh, who don't have cars. Many of them aren't uh, don't have a social and economic status to afford a car, and so if if we cut that resource out. Some people who don't have any alternatives are going to be stranded. And so that's, that's one factor that I think of as I, uh, as I evaluate what, uh, where we're going with the budget. Carrie. Um, so along those lines, I'm also thinking about the impact on people's tax bills. And most people saw their tax bills go up and in the reassessment process. Some people saw their tax bills go down. And so that's a huge equity difference. And if your, if your tax bill went down this year because of how your property was reassessed, then it's a much smaller impact on you if your taxes go up next year. But for people whose taxes already went up because of the reassessment, then to go up even farther. But I'm also wondering about, um, you know, at the state level, we have income sensitivity for property taxes and so we have a means to protect some people at the lower end of the income scale. I don't, do we have any sense of what that, what that impact is to people in Montpelier? Like, do we have any sense of, do most people in Montpelier qualify for some kind of income sensitivity? Okay, because that, that helps me to know, like if we raise taxes, uh, the people who are, who are getting the property tax rebates from the state may not actually affect them personally. So it may be, but if that's, if that's a lot of people, that, that's different than if it's just a few people, you know? So I'm not sure how to, to go with that. That's, that's, almost, that's school taxes. Yeah, but it's almost yeah. harder. Almost Except for school taxes, right? Don't right. qualify. It's significant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. No, it's, it's yeah. piece to that that's kind of fascinating is, or not fascinating, but looking at kind of being wonky and looking at this whole new assessment, is certain categories incurred greater increases and some had the decreases. Condos, for example, in a lot of condo neighborhoods actually went down. Yeah. Um, you know, Murray Hills and the Freedom Drives and a lot of those areas. Um, but somehow, multifamily properties 
which is a category which people who own those don't get prebates, um, those went up at much higher rates. The assessments went up a lot more. And so basically the taxes are being raised more on our more affordable rental properties in, in the current formula of the way it's working out. So I think you were starting to say something. Um, no, not really. I mean, it's, um, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven and nobody wants to die, really. Uh, <laughs> so that's where we are. Um, you have a smoke? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it would, you know, uh, this is my first time in, a, in the budget. I, I've gone through it in some detail. I've got, you know, just, I, there's some things I just need to have explained. Um, you know, the overtime thing, for example, popped out. So, I mean, I'm, <coughs> I come from a, a, an industry where, you know, overtime was, was uh, a no-no. Um, it's, it's, it's the cost of doing business in, in a municipality. Um, but, the, you know, the numbers are pretty eye-popping. So I just want to understand how that works, and, and it'd, be, it'd be helpful to hear it from the people who are actually going to have to manage it. Right. I, I was going to suggest that yeah. would be, uh, you can go through it in great detail, with those folks, I, in, in general, in, in the, sure. the, the elevator speech about that is that um, with DPW, overtime is almost always call out. So when they're out all night plowing snow, water main breaks, those kinds of things, uh, it's it's all, it, it's rarely scheduled unless there's something like they're doing line painting overnight. You know, when it's just a, it, it's a more efficient time to get work done. Um, so that theirs is usual response. Uh, police and fire are similar in that they do come out for specific events if they get call a major incident, a fire itself, if there's an ambulance call, someone might get called in. But because they're 24 hour operations, it's also replacing one another when they're away if someone's out sick or whatever, or mm -hmm. if there's a vacant position, you know, if, if someone's not on their shift that day, someone else gets called in from a day off to fill that shift. So they're getting overtime, and that is to provide the service. That's not a necessarily an inefficiency. It, it then becomes the point of is that, sh you know, there's always a balance of should we hire another person, full-time pay, versus in, in often, mo yeah, well, I mean, we're at the balance where we are, where it's still less expensive to fill in. But then, you know, one of the things we saw a couple of years ago was our, our numbers got down so low that um, it was it was dangerous for the staff because they're having to be called in so much. That's one of the reasons why we cut back the overnight police coverage and we and we had to readjust pay and everything to fill the position. So there's definitely a fine line, but that's, that's the short version of how overtime is used. Yeah. Otherwise, in our other departments, it's very little overtime. Yeah. Again, crisis only. Right. It, one of the that things sounds, that sounds complicated. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Lauren. And then Palin. Yeah, just, just one other lens that also I've been thinking about is, you know, like what are things, knowing that we're in this particular crisis year, and like what are projects, contracts, things that we could put off for one year that it's okay. Like we, we don't want to, and it does all pile up into the next year, and then the next year you're playing catch up yet again, which is kind of the way it's been since the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, that's like adding to the pressure here. Um, but if part of what I'm thinking about is, you know, having that priority list. So if we are able to advocate with our state delegation to have some, you know, uh, relief for communities that were flood impacted and some grants or things, like what would the go-to projects be? And what are those things that might be we could put on hold and would be top of our list if we do that, that if funding comes in? And I think that would also help us make the case to legislators of this is the urgent need that we have. This is if you give us funding, you know, we can do these things. So I think that exercise could be valuable. And I assume probably Bill could rattle off some of the things that were <laughs> cut that are really high pressing needs. And when you said there's a lot of bad decisions <laughs> last time, like probably part of those. Um, I mean, another thought just around the staffing issue, you know, we could, for example, think about like holding the positions open, maybe hold them open for six months and then we're paying half of a year's salary, but we're not eliminating them. Maybe we assess and realize, oh, it, it's been okay without it in some departments, but not in others. Um, but I think we could also try to think a little creatively of the, is there a way to save some money but not eliminate these positions, assess, is it working or not? If not, you know, know that the intention is to rehire as soon as resources allow or partway through the year to save some money. Just, I don't know, just a few ideas. 
Uh, so Do you have a response to that? I just wanted to offer a couple of comments on that, but I don't want to cut Palin off. Okay. It's well, okay. what? Go ahead, Palin. Uh, so I came um, on board last year, uh, kind of a late stage of um, the budgeting process. So that's why I'm asking this question. Will there be any proposed budget based on our feedback, or this is the only one we are getting? Okay. Thank so I'll, you. I'll answer those yeah. in two. So actually, I'll do Palin's first. Um, the way this works, uh, according to the charter and the law and everything, is that the, the city manager presents a budget to the city council, which has happened as of the date you set. It's now the city council's budget to decide what goes to the uh, voters. So we, so, so at this point, it's up to you to make whatever decisions you want to make with it. We will present you whatever you want. If you want more information, if you say, show us X, we'll provide you models. But at this point, we are not going to. There, normally, you would just talk and add, subtract, multiply, divide, do whatever you want to do with the budget you've had, um, because it's yours now. Uh, but we're here to help. We're, you know, we're your staff. We're your support. So if you want to see information, we'll provide that. I hope that answers okay, the question. Yeah. To Lauren's point um, about delaying projects, and I, I know you know this, but I'm saying it for everyone else to listen. Um, we did have over $3 million worth of requests for projects and equipment for the capital plan that did not make it into the $2.4 million. So we certainly have the backup list already. Uh, and I would remind the council and the public that in the fiscal year we're in right now, we have already reduced the approved budget by over a million dollars. So we are already operating on, um, and some of that included delaying some of these things. And that was due to loss of revenues from the flood-related revenues. So, you know, I think not to put the cart too far before the horse, if we were to get flood relief money from the feds, I mean, from the state, I think we'd just have a question of would we actually use it to make sure we were whole this year? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or do we see what we can put off till next year? And with regard to positions, you know, many of them are being held vacant right now um, because of, of these. I'd also add, um, without going into great detail, that not every position that was targeted for cut is um, unfilled. Uh, some of them are filled um, and would have impact on people. Uh, and some are still to be determined. Uh, so there's, a, I, I agree that just cutting vacant positions is not strategic. And I'd also agree with the comment that was made earlier that um, that there is, I think every department could articulate, and, and I've asked them to be prepared to do so, <clears throat> not to talk you out of what they propose, but so that the council can be clear what reduction in service you might expect as a result of these reductions, mm -hmm. so that people aren't led blindly. Because no one is saying we can do exactly what we do now with less people. I think what they're saying is, we can provide some services, but it will be different, and everyone should have their eyes wide open about that. To follow up on what you said about the potential for getting money from the state, the process you describe of trying to fill up the budget that we uh, missed out on in fiscal 2024 is essentially what we did with uh, a lot of the COVID money mm -hmm. when we had to make huge cuts in our budget. We then got uh, COVID relief money from the federal government. And most of what we did with that money is uh, restore, uh, restore capital uh, yeah. expenditures that we had to defer. Right. Um, Rose Bath, you've had your uh, hand up for a long time, and I really appreciate it. And I want to uh, want to call on you and give you a chance to uh, say what you're going to say. And thanks for being here and being patient. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, I wasn't sure. This is my first city council meeting, so I wasn't sure if there is a more set time, so I just raised it with item. so sorry about that. Okay, no, sorry. no apology sorry. necessary. <laughs> uh, so I am Rose Bath. I live up on George Street, and I um, am the commission, I'm the chair for the Mont Montpelier Conservation Commission. So I'm excited to be here. First time I've come to a city council meeting um primarily because we typically have our um commission meetings on the city council meeting date that is going to be changing with the new year um so that's very exciting so hopefully you guys get to know me a little bit better and so i'm just here today um i've been recommended by alec but 
you know, coming to these and, and advocating for the things that are important to us, like is an important part of this process. So I'm here today to ask you all to prioritize funding the Conservation Fund and the Conservation Commission. Some of the benefits of funding the Conservation Commission is that like Lauren had said earlier, um, these small funds, even though we're only asking for 3,500 for the commission, they can be used for in kind to get grants, which is like a huge thing that we try to do. And it's very difficult to get grants without some in kind. Our volunteer time like is at set rates generally. So it's at like usually $24, hour, $24 an hour. That is not necessarily the salary that we all get paid. And so that's where, um, you know, it is volunteer time and in kind contributions of hours can only go so far. Um, so even though it's a small amount of money, it does, it does pay dividends. Um, and so the commission also helps to inform the community about flooding and our flood infrastructure. One of those being the flood infrastructure walking tour brochures that we put out every year. Um, and we are hoping to do more flood infrastructure and fl flood flooding resilience type activities. But some of that requires, again, in-kind contributions to really compete for these grants. And ultimately, especially the conservation fund, um, which we requested $5,000 for, and, and that request has been put in the past years, but we haven't had anyone like available to come to these. Um, that conservation fund, we did um, give a grant this year of $5,000. And so we requested this year to basically reinstitute that $5,000 that we spent so that fund can continue to grow. And so, you know, ultimately the conservation commission um, which runs the conservation fund, we asked for that $5,000 of replenishment for the conservation fund and $3,500 for the commission, which is what we've gotten annually in the last two or three years, at least since I've been on. And so both of those things were not, um, not in the city manager budget. And so I'm just requesting them to be put back in. And um, as someone who's very familiar working in this space of, um, of government and municipal municipalities, I understand that with every cost you have, you have to have a solution, right, what you're cutting. And so my proposal um, is that, you know, we are currently planning in this new budget to up the technology professional service contractors by $13,000. If we were to not use that $13,000, we could fund the tree board, the Montpelier Conservation Commission, and the, um, and the fund, the conservation fund. So um, I think that's my three minutes, but I do really suggest that you guys get input from commissioners and give us the opportunity, just like you do departments, to 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 make our case. Um, it, you know, we're not engaged at the same level as departments, and I I really hope that you guys at least take that feedback. So thank you. Great, thanks. I appreciate your coming in. This is this is a good time to get more public input, and I see a, a hand raised. I'm sorry. I'm, why don't you come on up and speak? I'm Barbara Flourish. I'm the Vice President of the Friends of the Bridge. I'm here with Nancy Reed, who is the Vice President of the Bridge Board of Directors, and Larry Flourish, who is a member of the Board of Directors. I am responding to the proposal to cut the bridge, the city page that is running the bridge. Uh, it's been run for many years and to retain the recently initiated page in the Times Argus for the city page. Uh, I want to be clear that the Bridge Board of Directors, the Bridge staff, and the Friends of the Bridge Board of Directors has the highest respect for the Times Argus, our colleague journalist, and nothing that we say is meant in any way to disrespect the Times Argus. The Bridge is a nonprofit Montpelier-centric newspaper that connects the community by providing equitable access to information. So my husband and I were walking down to Sarducci's the other day and we were sort of approached by a man who was experiencing homelessness. And he said, or to my husband who writes a column for the bridge, he said, are you the man who writes that column? And my husband said, yes. And he smiled and he said, I love that column. And so the point of this is equality of access to information. Um, we provide the bridge free to every single resident of Montpelier and that engages everyone. The Times Argus circulation is 2,667 
and not all of those people live in Montpelier. Some do, obviously, but not all of them. And the cost for an annual subscription is over $400. We have a circulation of 10,500, 3,861 Montpelier residents get our newspaper every time it is published. We deliver it, we mail it to their homes. We deliver to Montpelier businesses and we put distribution points in Montpelier, free for pickup, free for all. And our cost is zero, it's free. So by providing information to all the residents through the Montpelier Bridge City page, Montpelier also discourages misinformation that can be what happens when public discussion forums or social media is the only way that people are getting information. And it seems that dropping that extreme broad, yeah, okay, so anyway, we are, we are reducing our requests from 14,400 to 9,600, a 33% decrease, and we ask that you support us, because we really get out there and do it. And I brought a handout for all the city council members that shows the, the reach that we have. Great, thanks for coming thanks. out. Uh, George. George, you, you raised your hand. conservation group um, I just wanted to tell you this is anecdotal but um, my wife called and my wife Jean Olson called and uh, she heard about this I think from maybe through the bridge I'm not sure <laughs> and uh, they showed up a person a woman showed up and talked about mitigating uh, water from our property I live on 25 Arbor Street we get a lot of flow from through our driveway went to the um, uh, 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 sewer right off, off the driveway, and a lot of stuff did. And she gave us suggestions on how to divert that to land with, with plants and so forth. We planted more plants and so on and so forth. And I, I thought that was a great suggestion. Uh, they, they weren't in, in favor of uh, gutters a lot. <laughs> but a lot of the water that flows off the house now ends up on land rather than in the sewer. And I thought that was a great suggestion. And, the, and it was free. So I know this is an opportunity cost. So you're talking about opportunity costs all the time now. What's the best next? What's the best next solution for you? Have, for you know, you can decide to uh, do public uh, services stuff, um, but you may not be able to do that if you decide to build a rec center, that sort of thing. So you, opportunity costs are important things. I know this is a small one, uh, but I, I really uh, think you should support that. Yeah. Thanks. yeah. I'm going to throw it open to any other members of the public who are uh, present in the room or who are online. So I'm not seeing any hands up oh, the got one. online participants, but I see Mr. Uh, Whitaker is, is here and looking to be uh, to be heard on the on the budget issues. <coughs> yeah, I, I'm grateful for the survey. Um, what I note is three of the priorities that if you look at the increase and maintain, you can, it, to a degree you can add those two together. And those who want to maintain it where it is and those who might want to increase it. So public restrooms combined are, total, are near 80% as a priority, but there's no department who's a, an advocate for that. So we need to address the fact, the things that have been neglected so long that aren't represented by a department interest need to be uh, factored in here. Uh, homeless services, uh, close to 75%, between 40% to maintain and 35% to increase. Um, so what I, in, in a nutshell, the, the takeaways I take from the survey are there's a real priority, a real emphasis, rightly so, on public restrooms, public works, public safety, and homelessness services, and that we've neglected those for a long time. 
public works, including the paving and the sidewalks and the snow removal. Um, so how are we going to finesse that those, we, we, it's not as simple as adding or padding in a few tens of thousands. I, un, I understand public works could benefit from another project engineer, you know, that's well and good. I think we need to be damn well ready when some more of this federal money starts to move. We need to have shovel-ready projects. And instead, we've been shelving projects. So, uh, but we also need a, a reorientation of that department that has engagement with the public on triage of what what gets prioritized, this kind of invisible process where public works gets triaged based on who, who complains the loudest and we finally fill a pothole. That pothole behind, you know, positive pie in that parking lot is deep and it's been there for a long time and it's, those are, they're simple things to fix and we don't have a system to fix them, right? So we need a triage, a rapid response that, and a lot of deep planning uh, to have shovel-ready projects. So we need to reconsider how we're, I think we're top-heavy in our administration with a, a city manager, assistant city manager, communications director, and the new, what was supposed to be an energy coordinator, you know, that's over $100,000 and, you know, maybe we can reuse Mr. Lumber in a different capacity, but I don't see that we're getting our best bang for the buck. We need to rethink how we're administering to get to those first core four priorities that I spoke to. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, George, you, oh, you're just grabbing your thing. Okay, got gotcha. you. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Uh, folks, I'd like to see if there are any, uh, any other people uh, out on the out Zoom who would like to be, uh, to be called on. I assure you that this is not going to be your only opportunity to talk to us about the budget because we've got uh, public hearings scheduled uh, right after the turn of the year. But uh, as we're as we're moving forward, if there's anything you want us to hear, I can guarantee you that we want to hear it. I'll pause for a little bit more. <laughs> okay, well, this is uh, this brings us up to 8.28, which is uh, the time for our 10-minute uh, break. So we'll, uh, we'll probably be back in here at uh, 8.40. Keep us informed. Uh, All right. Oh, it's up to you, guys. Oh, this happened. I was just talking to Jack about that. Trying to figure out where, Welcome where back, everybody. Where there is we are. Uh, we are back in session, and uh, and it is very clear that uh, we don't have any uh, decisions made tonight. We didn't expect to have any decisions made tonight. Um, I'm I'm going to suggest. Uh, as a way to go forward, that uh, there's been a lot of support on the council for uh, to put some to maintain our focus on on the core functions of public safety and public works, and uh, and so what I suggest we do is at our next meeting one of the things we we work on is talk about well if we were to restore some cuts in public service and public works, what would that do to the, to the rest of the budget? Uh, have, uh, ask the uh, department heads and the, and the manager to, to be prepared to talk about uh, those items in particular, because those are, that's where the money is, really. That's, those are the big uh, parts of the budget. There are, there are other uh, things that, uh, there's support for it's unclear how much support there is for it, and I know from talking to council members that uh, that there's a whole bunch of questions out there. And over the over the last couple of weeks, I've just been sh sending Bill 
multiple emails a day <laughs> with different questions. Well, what if we do this? What, what impact does that have? How, uh, and, and I know other people might say, well, it's unfair to send Bill all these emails uh, in the course of a day. Maybe what I should do Absolutely. is. Absolutely. <laughs> maybe what I should do is save up all my questions. And so instead of sending him 100 emails, I'll send him one email with 1,000 questions. And <laughs> I think either one works. But, uh, but this is really the time. Our next uh, meeting is a budget workshop. That's all we're doing next meeting. And so we, uh, we really need to be making progress to getting a, to a final budget that, uh, that we're going to put before the voters. And, uh, and so that's what I suggest as, uh, as a way forward. And I'm interested if, uh, if any members of the council have comments on, on that. There are a couple of other budget elements of water and stuff. When do we get, when do we get that stuff? We uh, the budgets are, are in the budget book. Um, <coughs> we need to present yeah. those in May and set rates. Right, okay. Yeah, so just to repeat that question for those that didn't hear, may not have heard the question and or the answer about the water and sewer budgets. Those are in your budget books. We typically spend most of our time um, in this time of year uh, on the general fund portion because that's the tax appropriation that the voters vote on in March. So it's the part that has to be done in a timely way to go to the voters. You can work on the water and sewer budgets. I mean, I think it's when you have DPW and you're talking, that's a good time to talk about water projects and those kinds of things, very important, and we need to let people know. But you don't really need to uh, approve those budgets until May, I think, and you set the rates for those. And you know, so yeah, I remember we did that. Right. But, yeah. So it's not, uh, you know, it's good to look at them all in sync. And there's certainly a relationship between the two because many positions are funded, you know, between multiple funds. You know, Kurtz, for example, is you know, uh, but other DPW workers and police are sometimes shifted between parking and other things. So they are, they do relate, but really the basically due to legal necessity, we focus mostly on the general fund portion this time of year. What about, um, you know, special, say, flood-related projects like, I remember we talked about the, uh, the waste treatment, by protect, you know, how close that mm -hmm. came during the flood, and uh, do, doing something to protect that. Is, where, where, is that where is that project, um, how is it budgeted? Mike Miller, planning director. So the the idea of elevating Dog River Road to protect the wastewater plant. So if anyone doesn't know this, um, just by the way the road is and not having any culverts under it, it acts as a levee to protect the wastewater plant. So the wastewater plant is actually at a much lower level and would flood if it wasn't for the road being there. But it's not as high as it could be or not as high as it should be if we wanted to go and really have it as almost a levee. It really should have a certain amount, one foot, two foot more. So we're working right now with Vermont Emergency Management, VEM. We're going to be putting in a brick application. Uh, these are actually put in by the state on our behalf. And that'll be going in in January or February. Josh has the exact date on that. Um, for us mere mortals, could you explain what brick means? I cannot tell you the abbreviation for brick. Uh, it but is an acronym. Of it is an acronym for um, building resilience and infrastructure. B R I C. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to guess on the C. Yeah. Basically, it's uh, they, they and they changed the name. So this is like one of the first or second years it's been called brick. So before that, it had a different name. Um, so uh, yeah, it's just the funding program that FEMA has. They have different programs for different pots of funds. Um, brick is generally used for scoping studies. So basically, that the, that first level. You know, how would we? protect the wastewater treatment plant by elevating the road. Once we get the results from that, Army Corps and other folks doing the research on that, then we would go back and apply for uh, the HMGP funding, which would be the funding that would actually build it. And so we would, it's just a kind of a, this chain of projects. So 
it is a project we're working on. Uh, hopefully we get funding in 24 and we can get some results and start getting the next level so we can start moving to engineering and construction. It takes time. So, I mean, if we were building in 25, I'd be happy, um, <coughs> but probably a 26 project. Yeah. Good, good, thanks. Let's turn it. Uh, and I know we really haven't had this discussion, but I've been a layperson Googling mitigation floods, and I've been definitely interested in these dam removals that have been going on. So I have two questions for DPW and maybe Mike, and that is, have, has the staff talked about some simple things to mitigate water impact on the stores, whether there's big tubes you fill with water or different porous concrete barriers you can put up. And two, have you all discussed the dams on Winooski and the North Branch? The North Branch is still pretty high. I was amazed driving down Elm Street. The backyards leveled with their yard. And that was today, like at 2 o'clock. So dams and Damn. permeated substance that will mitigate All right, we're downtown. working a little bit backwards. So the reason why the North Branch is still really high is because if you were to go up to the Wrightsville Reservoir, it was really, really full. A lot of water got backed up behind the Wrightsville. Um, I think it went up 30 feet in the last couple of hours, and then, then it starts to basically slowly go back down. So North Branch will be high for a while just because it's still draining out the Wrightsville Reservoir. Um, we do have some grant money that the Vermont River Conservancy has, and we've got some grant money to explore removing some of the dams. So we are looking at those as options and opportunities. And, um, oh, stores. Um, back Good to Brick. Before you finish oh, that. Before I, um, the state is also looking at that, and the commission, the, the Montpelier Commission on Resiliency and Recovery is working with the state um, as they look all their watersheds, dam removals on there. Priorities. Well, so it wouldn't be a local thing because it's not just us, it's all yeah, the way up Absolutely. But when I talked to two commissioners, they hadn't been part of that discussion. So, and that was just at the uh, parks uh, event that oh, they, they presented on meetings. Saturday. But, so, good. That's good. That's great. And mitigation Mitigation. Mi stores. Mitigation. This goes back to that scoping thing I was talking about. You got the, the brick for the scoping and the HMGP for the implementation. Um, so we have three projects that are going into the brick grant cycle. Uh, the first one we were talking about, Dog River Road. The, the second one is for um, scoping for downtown buildings as to how, what options homeowners or business owners would have to flood proof their buildings. Is it uh, floodgates? Is it, um, you know, what is it? So they're going to go through, um, if we got funded, there would be an analysis of all the downtown buildings or a certain number of downtown buildings. Obviously, we'd need the approval of whatever property owners are there. They have to participate. Um, but they would come in and do an assessment of the building to be able to offer the property owner, here is our recommended strategy to floodproof your building. We could put gates on the front. We could brick up this lower thing here. We could put a backflow preventer. Those types of things. They would look at all of your options to floodproof the buildings. and so. I love studies. They're, they're great, and I've always learned, and they've always made a better in project. But meanwhile, it can start raining tomorrow. And so I'm back to, is there any kind of work, any idea of putting together some expertise and offering workshops for business owners, as well as you have the building owners and you have the business owners, so that they could actually put something around their doors? Yeah, I mean, I guess if, we're, if, they're, if they're those types of options for quick things, if we want to get funding, we've got to follow FEMA's little thing. So if, if, and a lot of these things would cost a lot of money to um, think about some of these downtown block buildings, it may cost two or $300,000 to flood proof them to for have a for a single building. Um, and obviously we're not going to turn and just expect that the building owners are just going to be able to afford that. So by by following the FEMA procedures, we could qualify for hazard mitigation grants that we could use to help pay for those, assuming we can get through all the steps and the options are there. And the property owners, you know, have options they're willing to accept. Somebody may not be willing to accept a certain recommendation. So I, and I don't know how these will look. We're just going to have to wait. But at this point, it's federal money. Um, and this, these are the types of procedures that VEM, Vermont Emergency Management, says this is when we talk to them about 
you know, we really want to flood proof downtown buildings. They said, this is how to do it. Get the get the break funding, followed up with HMG. So no short term. They're not recommending any or uh, short term like we're work. We are working on some. I know yeah. Kurt was yeah. going to talk about backflow preventers probably. Sure. Yep. Uh, Kurt Monica, Public Works Director. Um, so the most recent flood, um, just uh, this week, um, was a lot of ba basements got filled with water, and that was because the river elevation came up higher than uh, the outfall pipes, the storm pipes. The sewer got inundated from the sewer uh, overflow point, actually was coming back into the sewer mains. So the sewer and the storm were completely plugged, and then that started coming in uh, through penetrations and in, in buildings' um, basements. And so um, the easiest, quickest fix is to put uh, either cap a penetration that's no longer in service, uh, or to put um, what's called a, a back check valve or a backflow preventer uh, on those pipes. That's right. Um, so buildings would need to turn off their water or tell uh, the, the occupants not to use any um, toilets or, or sinks um, during a flood event. But if, if that were done, then um, we could prevent a lot of what was what happened in this um, this most recent incident, um, just by preventing that water from coming in. So the idea is, um, uh, the city uh, works with a, a contracted plumber to do a lot of the city facility work, is to um, uh, basically have that plumber available um, with DPW expertise and uh, where the pipes are and how they might be um, prevent uh, what could be installed to prevent those uh, backflow events. Um, so we would go out with the plumber, assess the situation, um, and then the building owner could hire that plumber directly uh, to own. do the work. Or their own. It's just an option because we uh, so just... So are you going to be holding workshops on this as well as, I know you're probably sending so out information, but... No, yeah, I'm not necessarily planning workshops. So it's going to be more um, working with Evelyn to get the word out. We've already, I've already uh, emailed uh, Katie with Montpelier Live to get out to the business community. This is available. Here's to contact if you're interested in, in um, having a meeting to look at this. Um, we'll work with you. But not necessarily workshops because it's pretty straightforward. If you want to do this and invest in your property, we'll meet with you and we'll help you make it happen. And so, Kurt, to follow up on that, more detail than maybe people want uh, is, uh, is the process that you, you go to whatever the point in the building is that connects to the public sewer line and go in there and possibly jackhammer the, the cellar floor to, uh, <laughs> to do it and then in, in so, install one of these uh, backflow preventers. Uh, um, there may be instances where that's required. Um, the hope is that, you can, that we can do it on, the, on a pipe that's exiting a wall, mm -hmm. that you can put this valve. Uh -huh. Uh, in the in the piping that's exposed. And how much does one of those cost? It varies, right? Yeah, it really does. I don't. I hate to put a number on it. Hundreds, <laughs> thousands. Probably low, high hundreds, low thousands, somewhere in that okay. range. Yeah. I guess. We did one. I think it was hmm. in the nine hundred to a thousand range oh. for the hardware. Then you had to put it on. So. Less 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 than <laughs> the damage. They are a good value. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you have any before the flood to see they worked? We did it on our house when we renovated seven years ago. So it's been through. And it worked. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Thank Kurt. you. Thank you. So, Lauren, did you? No, thanks. Oh, okay. So, because we'd already gotten through that much, we've gotten through t uh, two of the three. So, brick, building resilience <laughs> on in infrastructure and building, communities. Building resilient infrastructure and communities. That's so right. that was brick. Um, so those we're currently looking at three brick applications. We've now talked about two of them just to get the last one out so people know about it. The third one is the Berlin Pond Dam, not the Berlin Pond Dam, but the one that's down below it, which has a small. Dicky Dam. So Dicky Dam has been having issues as a result of the flood, and so it should be examined and determined whether or not it needs to be removed. And obviously, in the town of Berlin, we'll have to have conversations about that. But that is our third scoping study: what to do about the Dicky Dam. Um, we have one hazard mitigation grant program, HMGP, and that uh, proposal is the one that's already been working for a while. It's the effluent pipe from the sewer plant that we turn on in the winter to help melt the snow from Bailey. So currently there's an over the ground pipe that 
then discharges the effluent from the sewer plant to Bailey Bridge, and it keeps the water warm so ice, dam ice dams don't build up. And we did it as a pilot program, and it worked, and it worked so good, we want to permanently put in the pipe. Um, that and a and r really doesn't like us running this pipe over the ground. So um, it's all already had its scoping done. It's already had its pilot done. So now it just needs construction money. So we're going to be looking at the HMGP first round to get money for that project. So those are the projects that we have currently in the pipeline for FEMA that Josh is mostly working on. So thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, and that last, you know, just as a point, I mean, not to, <laughs> waiting for the locusts, right? Um, <laughs> it's a good reminder that up until, you know, 10 years ago or so, our our top focus was on ice jam flooding. It was. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, that one of the top floods that people in Montpelier still remember is 92, and that had nothing to do with the rainfall or all these other things that do with ice jamming. So that is still a flood mitigation uh, issue that we have to keep in our forefront and, and keep working on because that could happen too. But we're not keeping the wrecking ball parked down by no, we're not. <laughs> the way we used to. <laughs> Donna. Putting a hose that sucks out water. No, uh, the hazard report that we got in our link, I think it's for today, was that paid for? Was that done by the state? Because it had all the dams, all the big dams. No, we, we did all of that work. So that hazard mitigation plan that you approved in the consent agenda item, um, we're required to do that every five years. We did it a year and a half ago. After a federal disaster, we are required to go through and evaluate our work plan, which was that table on page 78 that I highlighted. Um, and so all the staff uh, and leadership team went through all the items in there and looked at what ones we'd done, um, what was the status of them, and in light of the flood, what are all the new ones that we should be looking at and adding to the list? And those, when we apply for FEMA money, they like to see that the project is in your hazard mitigation plan. So we try to put as stuff as many things that we think are good ideas into the plan, so that way, in case something comes up, we can say, yeah, it is in our plan, it's right there. So that was... Dams, not just right yeah. so. You had yeah. Barry and you had Waterbury and one other, I can't remember. Yeah, we, we, so we did the work um, along with the Regional Planning Commission. So they did okay. some of the work sense. for us. I just wondered, because it seemed regional in some sections. Yeah, oh, and the, it was fully written by the Regional Planning Commission with us two years ago. We didn't make any edits to the other 78 pages. Yeah. Just, just the one table we changed for this one for the FEMA requirement. Thank you. Thanks. Lauren. I believe in addition, but Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, um, part at the uh, Commission for Recovery and Resilience, one of the members is um, works at Vermont Emergency Management in the flood resilient communities. And she was talking about what I believe is a complementary kind of analysis that they are doing um, that might be one of those same programs, but is looking, I think, a little more regionally at like what are those projects that can have the biggest um, impact for reducing flood levels. She was mentioning, for example, like the curve around 89 near Dog River, like that's a real pinch point apparently, but it's also really challenging to address. But um, but anyway, they're doing that analysis and she said there's going to be a list of projects and the timeline she estimated was by the fall of 2024, there would be projects and that we would you know, identify some priorities and that's, again, um, federal money that can help with some of those. So we should just be aware and keep an eye on what's happening there and if, if there's advocacy, um, just also on the dams to note that there is going to be, um, I know that there's, I think, going to be an active conversation in the State House about um, increased funding for dam removals um, for those dams that actually exacerbate flooding, like some of the ones we have locally, um, and increased kind of inspection and maintenance for um, dams like Wrightsville that are meant for flood control. So we might want to share the Montpelier story. Um, again, as part of that conversation, and I mean, certainly the, it would be much, it would be a competitive statewide. So um, you know, I was trying to get in that queue. So, folks, we've it feels like we've gone covered a lot of territory. We've gone a little bit far afield, but I think um, you know, I, I laid out a suggestion for where we go next time, and. Uh, 
I'm not hearing anyone say no. We're not. That's not how we should be doing it. So, uh, so I'll work with Bill to develop. Well, you know, who do we want to really have come in to be prepared to uh, make uh, presentations or to be prepared to answer questions? I encourage everybody to get uh, Bill your questions, no matter how many there are or how many or how small or picky they are, down to whether there are going to be pickleball lines on the tennis courts that are going to be resurfaced. Uh, the answer is yes, I, re I asked all that. <laughs> Did you know all these things add up? They, they, all, they all add up, that's right. But, and but so this is, you know, I, I, all kidding aside, I mean, I did ask you for that. So we, the more prepared we can be for these conversations of something, or if we can answer a question for you offline that, you know, typically we'll send it to everybody so that I did not send the pickleball answer to everybody. Mm -hmm. Typically we try to send the answers to everybody so that you're all getting the same information. Uh, and um, we want to be as responsive as can be. Uh, whether it's then or ha come prepared to this meeting with the right people and all that kind of thing. I, I, you know, a couple things I wrote down specifically, other than police, fire, and public works, uh, was the data on the state uh, income sensitivity uh, from up here. Who, you know, how the numbers, how many people get it, what's the total payment, what's the average payment, all that kind of thing. We that is available from the state. We, it's certainly available for. 2022, it may not yet be available for 2023, but we can get the most recent information uh, that we have. So All right. if there's any other follow-up, we're happy to do that. Okay, at that, we can, we can move on to the next item, which is other business, and to my knowledge, we don't have any other business. So now we can move to council reports. Starting at your end, uh, Donna. Sure. However you spend the next few days, holidays, and New Year's, may you all enjoy yourselves. I'm going to. <laughs> no report. Uh, I have no report. Our, our city staff, where, what's the schedule for city staff? If I send a big wad of questions over. Uh, well, of course. We're 24-7, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> City Hall is open, is closed on Monday, uh, and then the following Monday for okay, the so official okay. holidays. You know, I'll, um, we're uh, Kelly and I just send them to Kelly and I email, and we'll get them to the right people, and people will respond as they can, um, and we'll certainly be prepared yeah, for that's them. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I mean, you might not get an answer on the twenty fifth. Yeah, but. No, that's fine. <laughs> Please do not answer emails on the 25th. I got a pretty lengthy one last year from a, a resident on the 25th uh, <laughs> with a lot of complaints and a lot of things. Nice. Uh, Tim. We don't have a meeting for next week, right? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> so you, you can wait till next week to send it to the 10th. Be well, nice. no, we have one on the 3rd. We have one on the Budget third. worksheet oh, is on the 3rd. Yeah. The 10th yeah. is the next regular. But yeah, so we're, we're, we're here, or we're... Somewhere. I'll get somewhere, to yeah. Um, Tim, uh, your report? quick things. Hey, I'd, I'd like to thank Sarah and, and your staff for putting this notebook together because it is a great job and it's really helpful. Thank you. And two, um, it, it's been another crazy week in Montpelier and I want to thank city staff. I think folks that came out and tried to gauge what was going to happen with this big storm and then the follow through I, I thought was spectacular. So thank you. Um. Yeah, I don't have... Um, Anything to report? I wish everyone happy holidays. Um, it will be happy for my family because my daughter just got into Smith, so <laughs> she will be in Northampton uh, next year. And although she tells me, do not come and bother me, I am planning to go and <laughs> visit her. So. <laughs> she's, she's also going to be mortified that you mentioned it in public. <laughs> no, actually, I asked her, like, can I announce this? She said yes to that part, but second part was like kind of. <laughs> she didn't like that. We can hold a remote meeting if you have to. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I also just wanted to thank the city staff, like getting the volunteer tent up so quickly, all the community members that showed up and were 
making sandbags and putting stuff out. I mean, it was great to see everyone just coming together once again and trying to help. Um, and so glad that we averted another disaster, worst case scenario. Um, uh, people, I, several people like stopped me on the street to be like, the communications were really good. People really liked the, right, so, you know, again, like a lesson learned and great to see the, um, the right consistent and very clear and um, communication, so great job. And just, yeah, happy holidays to all. Yeah, um, I have very little to say. I, I want to uh, pile on and say great job to our city staff and our community at uh, responding to the uh, to the danger of the flood we didn't know it was going to stop rising and start uh, receding at nine o'clock and uh, and the the uh, quick response by city staff very uh, very great it's it it shows you know what what we're paying for is people say well they value i say people value the city services we have really good professionals at uh, in all of our departments and that's that's what we get for it and the uh, the community the spontaneous uh, volunteer effort from community members very inspiring I, uh, people love our community um, and again the communication was great uh, it, it started early, it, kept, it was regular, it was frequent, and it, it kept people updated with, uh, with information they needed. And uh, since then, I've, during the course of the week, people have said to me, well, were you, were you up real late uh, Monday night worrying about it? And I said, no, because we knew exactly what was going on. And it, uh, it stopped, <coughs> stopped raining and started going down early. So much better than last time around. Um, and everybody have a great time with your uh, with, with your families and friends, and uh, have a great holiday. And that's it for me. Next up, we have city clerk's report. And you have uncloaked. No. No. <laughs> Nothing to say. <discuss. laughs> gotcha. Very good, okay. All good, I just got unmuted. All good, no report. <laughs> and city manager's report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, thank you all. I, I wanna call out our team this week, um, you know, and, and the downtown community. You know, people were out there lifting stuff in their stores and really taking it, you know, seriously. I think for all of us, when we saw the projected, uh, that gauge with the projected height go from 9.7 to 16.8 in one hour, um, I, I, several people have used the term PTSD, and I know we were all, I know building owners and shop owners and our staff were all like, oh my God, that's not what we signed up for. Um, and so certainly jumped into gear. Uh, I've actually been quite sick this week. I didn't work today. I was not gonna work on Monday, and so I really wanna you know, tip my hat off to Kelly, who really led the efforts on Monday. Uh, I came in, but I wasn't good for much of anything, so uh, people know that we do have people, uh, you know, you can, someone can be away and we still have folks that can get the job done. Um, but really the whole team met, got things and, and we certainly did try to learn lessons from last time, but we also did a lot of what we did last time. And I just found it interesting that it was received differently this time. Maybe because the event wasn't as catastrophic, but like you said, none of us, uh, none of us knew where it was gonna go and we certainly had some uh, hairy moments as we watched that gauge creep up. But yeah, thanks to everybody. Uh, secondly, much less <coughs> exciting, but still pretty interesting. It looks as though we will be able to go back to City Hall. Cleared all the ADA hurdles. The only thing left is we want to make sure we test uh, the audio system and the, all that, um, because that is the reasonable accommodation. It hasn't been used since before the July flood. Um, so I think for now, we will plan on having that third workshop at City Hall, if that changes. We will let you know, um, but and then we will be able to meet there after that. Um, but um, but certainly, obviously, having the access. Um, and then the other question I have is, do you have a preference between this room and the school? This room, this room. Okay. Because hmm. if it's if it's not um, if it's not there, then we should, you know, 
maybe have a more regular place. I don't know. The seniors, I don't know. Are the seniors going to be mad at us, George, if we take their room? Oh, um, <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Just check it. I'm surprised that no, they didn't show up tonight. Yeah. <laughs> There's plenty of time, right? <laughs> yeah, so I think, okay, that, that's kind of my take, too, actually. I think we can hear better and all that stuff. But, um, okay, uh, I don't, do we, am I forgetting something? Because I probably am. FEMA? What? FEMA update. Oh, yeah. The uh, FEMA at uh, Country Club Road. Oh, well, I mean, you already know the update. Um, yeah, in the midst of everything on Monday, uh, it actually started with the mayor, and I got a call from VT Digger. <laughs> saying uh, FEMA's pulling out, and what's your comment? And we said, well, uh, that's good. <laughs> interesting. News to us. News to us. Uh, but we did, uh, in all fairness, they had scheduled a meeting with our team at like 10 or something to talk about plan change, potential changes in plan. So it wasn't like they were avoiding us. We they, Somehow it got out ahead of time. But we did talk with them. And uh, they are uh, making their change of plan, uh, which means that uh, really good news, really, that people will get are getting housing like now instead of in months. So the whole, if we, if we wind our clock all the way back, the whole point of this was to get people who had lost their homes into homes, and that's happening faster and more efficiently. So yay for that. Um, they uh, have agreed. In fact, in lightning speed, uh, you see how slow it worked um, today. I uh, e signed a. a a uh, lease amendment which basically says they will prepay the first uh, $514,000 for 12 months guaranteed rent. And um, it got e signed back, and we've in already invoiced them. And so they said, they said we should have payment in two or three days. So even if it's two or three weeks, uh, that's $514,000 for being uh, willing to support um, something there. We'll have on your updated agenda in January the, the regular meeting, you know, some suggested uses for that fund, for those funds. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, it could be setting it aside for development of that property. It could be investing in water lines now, knowing that we have to invest in that water line later. If we go forward, it could be putting it in the general fund to replenish our fund balance. You know, there's a lot of uses. There's flood resiliency. I mean, there's many. There's a there's a good use for for it. Um, what we should not use it for is a, a budget plug because it's one time That's windfall, right. and it needs to be um, identified for the specific project. So, uh, but it's a good situation to be in. Uh, I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Ed. To that extent, uh, hands off to Mike and to Josh, Jerome, who's not here, um, for negotiating that lease in the first place that got us in this position and for and for, and for demanding the guaranteed time. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So. And is that it for you? That's it for me. All right. So at 919, we are adjourned. <coughs>